Assalamu alaikum everybody, you're with Mustafa Rishwani on The Voice of Islam today. Um, we have in the studio with us uh, Jason Clare, member for Black's Land and current uh, Labour participant in the election. Uh, good afternoon, um, Jason, how are you? Oh, good it's morning actually, good morning. <laughs> good morning and assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. So Jason, do you want to give us a quick intro to yourself and, and you know the area that you represent? Yeah, sure. Uh, I represent the seat of Blacksland, uh, which is uh, here in southwest Sydney. It, it stretches from Bankstown all the way up to Granville South and over to Guildford and then back down to where Bankstown Airport is. Uh, so it's in uh, the heart of, of Western Sydney, about 150,000 people live in uh, the seat of Blacksland and uh, a very, very big uh, Arabic speaking population, big Vietnamese speaking population and big Chinese population here in our local area. I grew up uh, here. Uh, I grew up in Cabramatta, um, uh, which is now just outside the seat, but was inside the seat of Blacksland. And uh, I went to Cabramatta Public School and Canley Vale High School. Yep. My mum and dad still live in the same house uh, that they Perfect. built over 40 years ago. Wow. And uh, um, I'm the first person in the family to ever finish school. Uh, mum got really sick when she was uh, in primary school and, and was in bed for two years. And uh, only got to year seven and my dad he uh, uh, he finished in year nine and he became an apprentice and so I was the first person in the whole family that's ever finished school and then gone on to university uh, I became a lawyer and, and then a bit over five years ago I got the great privilege to represent our area in in federal parliament wow awesome and um, since then how many elections have you won Two, two. Uh, so I was um, I was elected by our community in 2007 and then again in, in 2010, and then uh, we've got this election, which is going to be a very a big, tough fight uh, on Saturday um, to have the, the, the honour and the privilege to continue to represent our community. Yep. Um, before we do get into some of the policies that the Labor's um, talking about, I, I thought I'd just maybe reference the fact that, uh, in general, um, across the nation, the Liberals are leading Labor, but in Black's land, uh, Labor's still leading Liberals. I think your chances are pretty good, but how do you feel about Labor's chances uh, across, you know, across the nation? It's very tough. We're behind, and uh, if the polls are right, then Tony Abbott will win the election on Saturday, uh, which I believe will be bad for our area because the Liberals' policies are not good for our area. Uh, their policies on education are to cut money out of our schools. Uh, their policies on family payments are to cut money to mums and dads to help our kids go to schools. Their policies on things like the national broadband network are not to build the network to our homes. And their policies on things like Palestine, I think, don't represent the views of our local community. Well, since we're talking about our local community and you do reference Palestine, what, are, what, are the, what is the Labor position on Palestine? Oh, I'm, I'm glad you asked because this is one of those policy areas where there's a big difference between Labor and Liberal. Uh, Labor changed its position last year and decided that instead of voting against Palestine having observer status at the UN, we wouldn't stand in, in the way. And uh, at the time, Tony Abbott said that was the wrong decision and that if he becomes Prime Minister, they will reverse that decision and oppose Palestine having uh, status at the United Nations. So the two parties have got a very big difference of opinion when it comes to representation of Palestine at the UN. We also have a big uh, there is a big difference between Labor and Liberal on s Israeli settlements on the West Bank. Uh, we've said very clearly, Bob Carr, the Labor Foreign Minister, has said that all settlements on the West Bank are illegal under international law and should cease. And we've been criticised by the Liberal Party for that. So on the issue of Palestine, this is very, very clear. Labor uh, went out of its way last year to change its policy and that assisted Palestine being represented at the UN. The Liberal Party opposed that and said they would reverse that if they win on the weekend. Just to be clear, the vote that Australia put forward at the UN, was it, an ab was it abstaining from voting or was it a vote for Palestine? It was an abstention. We moved from uh, outright opposition to removing that opposition and abstaining from the vote like a lot of countries did. There are only a few countries now that voted against it and the overwhelming majority of the world either voted in support or abstained. Uh, if there's a change of government on the weekend, on Saturday, then Labor uh, and Labor loses the election, uh, then Tony Abbott and the Liberal Party would go back to opposing Palestine's representation in the UN. 
Fair enough. Um, I think that is an interesting point. I think the local community will keep in mind. But, um, yeah, well, you, you mentioned earlier about the percentage of the population um, in the local area that is uh, Arabic-speaking and Vietnamese-speaking, Chinese-speaking. Um, we are on uh, an Islamic radio station, so we'll focus a little bit on, on the um, the Muslims and the Arab-speaking uh, community in, in Blacksland. So um, just off the 2011 census, it shows that there was a very strong migrant and religious population in, in Blacksland. So um, there is... There is general feeling that Labour has not really done enough um, for the community here, due mainly to the fact that it's been a Labour stronghold for so long. Um, what are your comments on, on Labour's uh, activities in Black Sands, so whether or not Labour has been active, and what, do you th what is Labour planning to do in the future for this um, community? Well, it's a great privilege to represent our area, and I don't take it for granted. I work hard every single day to represent all of the people of our, our area. Uh, particularly the Islamic community. It's a large community that needs support. And uh, let me give you a couple of examples of the things that we've done. Uh, I know Tony Burke, uh, in representing uh, the area of Lakemba, would say exactly the same thing. We've worked together to get extra money for our schools. Our schools in the area have got $60 million in extra money for reading and writing and extra teacher support uh, to make sure that kids don't fall behind in the classroom. And if we're elected, we've said that we will inject an extra $10 billion into our primary schools and high schools right across the country to make sure that we've got uh, the first class or world class education in our schools. The Liberal Party have said they'll cut about $8 billion of that out. So there's another big difference between Labor and Liberal. We believe the key to the future is education and supporting our schools, whether they're public or private, and we've matched those words with money and we'll do more if we're elected. The Liberal Party have said they'll cut about $8 billion from what we propose to spend on education. Uh, another area where I've dedicated so much work and so much energy is to aged care. Uh, we don't have an Islamic aged care centre in Australia at the moment, and I think that's a terrible thing. Uh, when you get older, you sometimes forget the language that you've learned in Australia, English, you go back to your first tongue, you want to make sure that people, when they get old, if they're suffering from dementia, have the comfort of knowing that the doctors and the nurses that are look aftering them, look, looking after them can speak Arabic, can provide you with food that you love, feel comfortable in your environment and being able to pray in, in your faith. We can't, uh, we, you can't do that at the moment. Uh, but the work that I've done with Tony Burke uh, has meant that we were able to announce at a $10 million to build Australia's first Muslim aged care centre just behind the mosque in Lakemba. Right, and uh, we are quite happy with that as a community and there was a lot of community discussion around it. But one of the questions was, uh, is it a bit too late? Uh, well, I think the, the, the Arabic-speaking community generally, and in particular the Muslim community, have, uh, have identified this as an issue in the last year or two as being very important. The Italians, the Greeks and the Chinese over the last decade or so have been raising money and getting government support to build aged care centres. Over the course of the last few years, uh, the Islamic community here in our local area have made it very clear this is the next big challenge. We're investing in schools, but our community is getting older. We need aged care. And this is going to get bigger over the next 10 years. All of the research shows that the two communities in Sydney that are going to need aged care more than any other uh, is the Arabic-speaking community, in particular the, the Lebanese community, and the Vietnamese community. So that's where we've focused our attention now. It's a challenge now, but it's going to get bigger in the next decade. And so we're going to need not just one aged care centre, but more in other parts of the country as well. Yeah, uh, I agree, and I think that it might uh, change things in the community um, should it come through. But um, the $10 million wasn't the only thing announced on, on that day. It was aid this year, which was uh, nearly a month and a half ago. Mm. Um, there was a $2.5 million announced for the, for the youth, if I, if I do... Um, that's right, that's yeah. right. This is, uh, this is another thing that I've been working on uh, with Samir Dandan and uh, the LMA over the last six months. Um, we've, got, we've got two big challenges. One helping our young people by making sure that our schools have everything that they, they, they need and should have, as well as helping our elderly community. And for young people that have left school and can't find a job, we've got to make sure that we've got the systems in place to help young people get a job. And young people that are falling off the tracks and getting into trouble, we've got to be able to make sure that we've got the services there to reach out and help people. 
And this money will do just that. Uh, it's designed to make sure that we've got outreach services uh, run by the LMA to make contact with the local community, with young people, make sure that they feel wanted and needed by our community and have the services that our young people need. So I think it's a, I think it's a great project. It's, the, it's not a government idea. It's an idea that's been developed by the community, by the LMA, and the government said, look, we think what you've got here is a great plan. We want to support it and implement it. So are th is these, you know, this influx of funding, is this an indication of Labor's stance on the community in the future? Well, I, I think Labor has always understood how important the Muslim community is in our local area and worked closely with it for decades. Um, the Liberal Party have just found the Muslim community and think 10 days before an election, uh, that they suddenly um, care about the community and can win their votes. Uh, the Labor Party has been here for a very long time, always working with the community, whether it's on school projects or now aged care projects. Our views are very, very clear and consistent. If you look at the Liberal Party, there are people in the Liberal Party who say some terrible things about Islam. Corey Bernardi is a word that must um, sort of ricochet in horror through every listener's mind. People who've said things like Islam is the problem or that Islam is a totalitarian ideology. The Liberal Party in private and some people in public say awful things about our Muslim community. The Labor Party is the party that's always been here working hard for our community. We've got to do a lot more. Uh, and I've flagged where I think the focus has got to be. First on education for our kids, second on aged care for our elderly community, and third, it's probably making sure that our communities are as safe as they possibly can be by making sure that we don't have a, our community being terrorised by people shooting at houses and uh, making people feel uh, unsafe. Crime is an issue. Uh, you do bring that up. And we do have um, shootings and, and crimes that occur quite mm -hmm. regularly throughout um, the Black Sand area. Um, so what has Labor announced any policy specifically targeted at these crimes? Yeah, this is an area I work directly on as the Minister for Home Affairs. We've got a lot of guns out there on the street, about a quarter of a million guns in the hands of criminals. And these are, these are guns that are stolen from legitimate owners and then go into the hands of criminals. And a lot of people uh, are afraid to tell police who are, who's shooting at them or who's shooting at their family, who's shooting at their house because they fear retribution. Uh, what I'm doing is two main things. First, I'm setting up a national anti-gang task force to help the state police. They've al we've already set up a, an anti-gang uh, intelligence centre in Canberra and by the end of this year we'll have strike teams here in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane to work with the state police on this issue. People want it fixed, they want their community to be safe. The second thing I'm doing is asking for a change in the law. A lot of the criminals that we're talking about um, are more afraid of losing their money than they are of going to jail. And so we need tougher laws to seize the assets of criminals, working with the tax office and the police, and tougher laws for police to seize the guns off the criminals. They often know who the criminals are. I've argued that the state police should be given random powers to search serious criminals, people with a criminal record for guns, to get the guns off the street. That's an interesting point that you do bring up, uh, increased uh, police powers. It's not the first time that something like that has occurred when um, uh, John Howard introduced the uh, terrorism laws uh, nearly a decade ago. Um, and there was a lot of um, negative uh, you could say connotations attached to that because of some incidents in which police uh, used more power than they probably should have. So there's, there is a fear that um, the community could be targeted if, 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 it's, um, if there's improved kind of police uh, attention to it. Do you feel that that could be an issue down the track? It depends on how you draft the law uh, and there's a model for this uh, called firearm prohibition orders that exist in South Australia and they're targeted at outlaw motorcycle gangs. Most of the, most of the criminals that are shooting at our houses are linked to outlaw motorcycle gangs and so if we do what South Australia has done which is design a law which allows police to stop uh, bikey gang members from carrying weapons, then we won't have the problems that John Howard created so many years ago. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope that that, because I do have a lot of personal friends that have had a lot of issues with police, uh, you could say, um, you know, using more force than is reasonable, random searches, mm. sometimes it feel, they feel like they're being targeted. So um, I do hope that that works out for the better. But um, I'd just like to take you back just a little bit to when you when you talked about funding for the schools. Mm. Now, um, according to the, the um, announcement that Julia Gillard made a couple of months ago in, re in regards to the Gonski That's right, report, yeah. um, money will be taken from universities to 
put in uh, mm. schools. Do you feel that that could f- uh, affect university admissions as well as university um, funding to be able to maintain their students? Well, the, the amount of funding going into universities continues to rise. Uh, the change that was made by Julia Gillard just means that it rises at a slower rate than it was originally intended to. The Labor Party has invested enormous amounts of money into universities over the last few years and in particular has given money to universities if they, if they enrol young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And here in South West Sydney it's seen a massive increase in the number of young people like me uh, who come from places like Cabramatta who are now getting into university. That's because of the policies the government's put in place. But you're right, some of the money that we were going to put into universities we're now allocating to our primary schools and our high schools because what Gonski found is that we're not resourcing our schools enough. Um, Think about this. Most of the jobs that are being created right now and most of the jobs that will be created next year and in the years ahead are going to require you to finish school and then go to TAFE or to university. That's going to be the requirement. The days when you could finish in year 10 and then get a job straight away are disappearing and we need to make sure that young people here in Lakemba, but in Cabramatta, in Banks, and right across Western Sydney, finish school and get a great education. Uh, at the moment, there's a, there's, a, there's a big difference between the number of people who finish school here and the number of people who finish school in Mossman or in the eastern suburbs. Now, if that continues, we're going to see disadvantage in our local community continue because we won't get the education rates here that exist in other parts of Sydney or other parts of Australia. Gonski's designed to fix that by putting more money into the schools and the students that need it. So there's a base amount of money for every student and then extra money for young people that come from a non-English speaking background or from disadvantaged backgrounds. That's $10 billion. The Liberals have said they'll put in 2.8. So it's chalk and cheese. If you believe in education and you think that it's the game changer that will help to fix the problems in our community like unemployment, then you'd vote Labor. Didn't Tony Abbott though announce that he will match uh, Labor spending and the, and the Gonski reforms that Labor has introduced? Only the first four years. And the big money is in years five and six. So it's a, it's a bit of a sleight of hand. If you look at the mathematics, what it means is Labor puts in $10 billion, the Liberals put in 2.8. It's chalk and cheese. Yes, I, I guess so. it is pretty interesting that the, the, that the Labor's have... Um Sorry, that Liberal have decided to match up for only four years. But nonetheless, um, you, you did say that you did take money from the universities. Can I ask how much exactly is going to be taken from universities? Oh, it, it's in, in real terms, as a proportion of all of the money going into universities, it's, it's, it's small in terms of the total amount of investment in universities. Uh, but um, the money going into schools over those six years is $10 billion, enormous. Let me tell you why I think this is important. I had a report given to me the other day that showed that if you speak English fluently in our local area, then the chances of you being unemployed are 5%. But if you can't speak English well, the chances of being unemployed are 18%. And if you can't speak English at all, the chances of being unemployed in our local area are 25%. So there's a key link between our education system and our English language training and the ability to get a job. Uh, So the more we invest here, both in our schools, but also in those English language training courses that you get when you come to Australia, are critical. If we don't focus here at the very beginning, then we're going to lock people into a system where they can't get a job and they feel isolated and alone in what is the best country in the world. So do you feel like English training is essential to economic policy? I do. On the note of economic policy, the Liberals have made a very big uh, issue out of a surplus coming in 2015, 2016, and and that's how they've based their economic policy around that. Uh, My question then is, how important does Labor feel a surplus is coming in the next uh, five to six years, and whether or not it's actually achievable? Well, the Liberals have now said they won't promise a surplus. Um, They've decided uh, to remove that commitment, and that was a change they made just a couple of weeks ago. Mm. it is important for the budget to return to surplus, um, but it needs to be done in a way that ensures that you don't cut the things that are important, uh, health services, education services, things that parents rely on. Um, let me give you another example. Uh, there's, there's a payment that mums and dads get called the school kids bonus. 
And everyone listening that's got a child will know how important this money is. If you've got a child at primary school, you get $410. If you've got a, a child at high school, you get $820 a year. And this is money to pay for school shoes, uniforms, all of the basics, the things that you need to help get your child through school. If you've got two kids, over the time that they're at school, you, you get $15,000 from the government. And if you've got four children, then that's $30,000. It's a lot of money designed to help mums and dads. Now, if Tony Abbott is elected on the weekend, that goes. That goes. It'll be cut, and parents won't have that money anymore. So what I'm saying to you is that it's important to bring the budget back to surplus, but it's important to, have, to be uh, allocating money in the right ways to parents who need it, the Liberal Party say they'll cut this money and it will hurt our local community badly. It's not the only cuts that they've, they're have they putting forward. Uh, there's a lot of cuts that they're there putting are. forward. And, and yeah, there's, there, there are. If you're, let me give you two more examples because we're hearing more and more cuts every day. Uh, there is a payment called the Battler's Bonus for pensioners and for people who are on low incomes. And it's about $210 a year for people who are single and 300 and ten dollars if you're a couple and this is a little bit of extra money that the government gives you just to pay for things that you couldn't anticipate like a medical bill or like a repair to your car that will go on saturday if tony abbott's elected he will cut that and that will disappear if if you're earning less than thirty seven thousand dollars a year uh, then your sup your superannuation is going to get another tax on it uh, we've taken a certain tax off superannuation for people on low incomes. Tony Abbott has said he'll put that back. So people on low incomes in our area that rely upon their superannuation when they retire, that rely on the battler's bonus just to pay the bills, that rely on the school kids' bonus to get the kids to school, they're the ones that are going to get hit by Tony Abbott's cuts. Well, Tony Abbott has justified his cuts by saying that the, the reason he has focused so much on surplus or you know, not necessarily surplus, as you've just said, but the reason of putting forward the cuts is to specifically strengthen the economy. Because the mining boom, as uh, most people have agreed, is coming to an end. And Australia has been very reliant on the mining boom uh, for our economic strength and stability for nearly two or three decades now. It got us through the GFC. So what, what is Labor doing? So uh, Labor, sorry. Liberal have clearly um, noticed that there is an economic struggle coming and, and they've approached it this way. Does Labor feel that the economic struggle is going to be not as strong as um, Liberal is stating it out to be or do they feel that they have another way of approaching it? Well, the, the key to the future for Australia is capitalising on the growth of Asia, China, India, uh, Japan, South Korea and those other countries that are starting to boom like Vietnam. Uh, by the end of this decade about half the world's middle class will live in Asia. And that provides a massive opportunity for Australia. I, I, describe, I describe it sometimes like this. At the moment, Australia is a bit like a petrol station and we need to turn Australia into, into a department store. At the moment, we're selling resources, fuel, iron ore and coal to, to China and to other countries in Asia. But as they get richer and wealthier, they'll want more than just iron ore and coal to build cities. They'll want luxury goods, they'll want financial services, legal services, education for their kids and they'll have money to pay for it. They'll want the sort of food that we eat. And it's up to Australia to have an economy that's shaped and designed to sell Asia those services. Because if we don't, America will or Europe will. That's the challenge for us, to make sure that we build the workforce and the companies that can make the most out of having a big, rich next door neighbour. So that's, I think, one of the big challenges for us in the future. And it's important that economic policy is designed to make sure that we are successful in the Asian century. Well, yeah, I do think it's very important as well, but um, we'll see how, how Labor goes with that. Um, I'm just going to bring it back to the local community again, sorry. You're but, right. Um, 
there is legislation that's being touted around the community that, that many people feel is very, very important. It's United Against Discrimination. <coughs> and it's based on the fact that uh, the community here feels a little bit, as I said, targeted beforehand, and, and they feel mm. a little bit discriminated against by some people in the media, some people uh, in newspapers and radio, and, and sometimes even by politicians in themselves. Um, and they feel that there is not a, a, an understanding of, of Islam and Muslims in the local community as well, um, and that the discrimination is, is quite strong in, in the public sphere. Um, so a lot of people have decided that uh, uh, legislation is the answer to this uh, problem. Is the labor for a, a legislation that would um, make illegal discrimination based on religion? At the moment, we've got discrimination based on age and based on sex and based on race and disability. And earlier this year, uh, we had a, um, the release of a draft piece of legislation to try and bring them all together into one, one law, one national anti-discrimination law. And you're right, at the moment, religion doesn't come into that. Uh, it does... Um, apply to the workplace so you can't be discriminated against on the basis of your religion in the workplace but it's not as broad as what you've just described and we received a number of submissions uh, from the community about the the benefit or the value of incorporating religion into that piece of legislation what the Attorney General did uh, a few months ago is uh, is say that he would consider those recommendations uh, from the community, but also recommendations from a parliamentary committee that's looking at this and next year bring forward another bill. We've got an open mind about it. The government hasn't made a decision. but sought advice on this from the Attorney General's department. Again, it's an area where there's difference between Labor and Liberal. In the Race Discrimination Act at the moment, there's a section called Section 18C, uh, which bans hate speech. Um, uh, some of the, the nasty, vitriolic uh, racist speech that we see in our community. It's an important provision we believe that needs to stay. Uh, the Liberal Party has said that if they win the election then they will remove that section from the Race Discrimination Act uh, which would um, cease to make illegal some very nasty racist comments that have been made in the community. Uh, so again I, I think you see big differences here between Labor and Liberal. But will Labor put forward the, the legislation, the proposed legislation? We're looking at it now. Uh, we've got an open mind. We haven't made a decision. The Attorney General said that he'll look at the recommendations that have come from our local community, uh, but also from the parliamentary committee that looked at it, uh, and seek advice from the department. But there's no decision being made yet. Is there a reason why a decision hasn't been made? or Is it unclear that um, discrimination is so you know, uh, powerful and, and, and wide-ranging in the public sphere? Oh, n not at all. You, you see examples of it. Uh, all the time. I, m I gave you one example, the words of Liberal Senator Cory Bernardi saying Islam is the problem. Awful, atrocious comments. Um, it is important, I think, to make sure that uh, when you make big changes in the law that you do it um, in a methodical way. And the Attorney General has said that the current law, which was designed to merge everything together rather than create new law, um, needs to be carefully considered before we take the next step and expand the law. So he said we'll look at that now and make a decision next year. So it, it's down the track, you could say? Yeah, he, he said, look, no decision one way or the other. We'll look at it uh, and uh, make a decision next year. Right. So um, as we said earlier, the, there is a very strong migrant population in Blacksland, um, as, as you said and we pointed out. Um, and uh, Labor has a very strong policy on refugees and refugees coming from... Mm. Uh, via boats, boat people, quote-unquote. Do you feel that sometimes the, uh, the, the policy can be a little unfair or cruel on the, ref on the boat people um, and that sometimes the, the vitriolic speech that is generally in the public sphere is only gonna, going to be promoted by a policy like that? My, my view is what's unfair is people dying to get here. We're the best country in the world, which is why people fleeing per persecution want to come to Australia. But you shouldn't have to drown in the middle of the ocean to get here. Uh, we're a great country. We take more refugees and settle more refugees here in Australia per capita than any other country in the world. We take 20,000 refugees uh, at the moment. But that's per capita. That's not, per capita. It's not necessarily actually more than any other no, country. No, no, but, uh, okay, forget per capita. Uh, in real numbers, I think we, we rate second or third after America and Canada. Uh, so I think we can, we can put our hand on our heart and say that we are a good kind, generous country that takes many refugees. We're taking, um, j just to explain where we've come, last year we took uh, 13,000 refugees, we've decided to up that to 20, 
And we've said that if we can if we can set up a system where people don't have to pay somebody ten thousand dollars to come here, then we'll look at increasing that again to twenty seven thousand. The key here is if you want to come to Australia and seek asylum, the best way to do it is through the UN, not getting onto a boat and drowning. I a couple of months ago had to do a press conference and tell people that a two and a half month old baby boy had drowned hanging on to a life jacket. Um, you shouldn't have to put your life, your wife's life and your children's life at risk in rough ocean between Indonesia and Australia to seek asylum. There's got to be a better way. But don't you think that's a reflection of how desperate these people are? Oh, uh, n no doubt uh, that many people are desperate. Um, but the way to do that is to knock on the door of the UN in Jakarta, not knock on the door of a people smuggler who pushes too many people onto boats, they're overcrowded, the boat breaks down halfway here and people sink to the bottom of the ocean. That is the worst way to die and it shouldn't be the way that people seek asylum. But the fact that there's millions and millions of refugees, it's going to be difficult for someone you know, in a war-torn country to be able to go through the processes quickly and efficiently to get their family out of you know, what is uh, a very dangerous situation. Shouldn't Australia be trying to help these people instead of um, deterring them? Oh, and we do, but through the UN. Think about what happened after the Vietnam War. 1975, Saigon fell to the communists and people fled in boats. And they didn't flee in boats to Australia, they fled in boats to nearby countries, Malaysia, Philippines and Thailand, in the, in the hundreds of thousands. And the United Nations came in and worked with the countries of the region to set up UN refugee camps and then work with the countries of the world to find a place to settle them. Uh, whether it was America or Canada or France or Australia, we took hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese refugees. They've become uh, now very, uh, Australian citizens. But the way it worked was not paying a people smuggler and drowning on the way to Australia. It was working with the UN and the countries of the regions to solve the problem. And uh, the UN ended up winning a Nobel Peace Prize, a Nobel Prize for the work they did. Now that's the way to fix this. If people are fleeing persecution anywhere in the world, then it's important that the countries involved, whether it's the source countries or the transit countries or, the, or countries like Australia, all work together to make sure that people can be protected and settled and not uh, drown in the middle of the ocean, which is what's happening, or which, which is what's been happening. But the fact of the matter is that people are fleeing persecution and the, the people need, they need help. They don't need to be sent to PNG. Well, uh, they're no longer um, being persecuted once they get to Indonesia, okay? And that's what I'm saying here is that if, if you've fled persecution and you find yourself in Malaysia or Indonesia, then the way to seek asylum in Australia is by going to the United Nations. If you pay a people smuggler $10,000, then you're just paying a criminal and expanding a criminal's business and potentially putting your family's life at risk. But I don't think it's necessary. It's not like a shopping choice. They, they, they don't you know, go through shopping, decide, oh, we're going to go to Indonesia instead of going straight to Australia. As you said, the people are desperate um, and, and a solution is being provided by certain people. Why does Australia need to necessarily put such a hard stance on, on these people only seeking asylum? If, if the, the uh, smugglers are the issue, then why aren't we going to the, 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 the nations where the smugglers are coming from and dealing with them no, directly? And, and we do. And we do. We work very closely with the Indonesian police. Uh, they're, the, they're the responsible law enforcement agencies there that target people smugglers. Um, you know, let's, let's be clear about what these people are about. They, they make a fortune putting people onto a boat. It's a major, major business. Um, if you put hundreds of people onto a boat, you can make up to a million dollars or sometimes more. Um, so they're in it for the money, not to try and help desperate people. And I have had to tell Australia too many times that people are dead, that people have drowned in the middle of the ocean. I've seen the photographs. I can only imagine the horror of hanging onto a piece of wood for three days with no one coming to your rescue to know this is not the way to help desperate people. And people smugglers are exploiting them. We need to work together with Indonesia and the countries of our region to find a better way. I agree that people smuggling, people smuggling is, is an issue, but I think that by focusing the legislation and focusing the policy on them, you're forgetting the actual people, the, the people that are seeking asylum. And as uh, you know, Amnesty and, and the Greens have mm. pointed out, seeking asylum is a human right. And by turning boats away, most people are in the opinion that Australia is breaching their, uh, you know, their 
responsibilities under the Convention for Refugees, the United Nations Convention for Refugees. Do you well, believe that? No, 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 that, that's not our view. Our, our view is that we're um, complying with both domestic and international law. Um, mind you, you talked about turning votes away. We, we're not doing that. Um, what the Liberal Party would do if they were elected is push votes back to Indonesia. That's a recipe for disaster. Uh, what we know is that if you turn a boat back and push it back to Indonesia, then the master of the vessel will put a hole in the in the ship, it'll start to sink, it'll order people into the water, our Navy personnel will have to go into the water to try and rescue people, and there's a risk that people will die. Uh, we've seen examples of this happen before, and I, I, I am concerned that if uh, attempts are made to push vessels back to Indonesia, then we'll see a repeat of what's happened in the past where people's lives are put at risk. So the solution is then to just to bring the boats onto Australia and then turn them or take them to PNG? The solution is to remove the incentive to get onto a boat in the first place. Um, people want to come to Australia because it's, it's a fantastic place. We love Australia. Everybody knows how great we are. Um, what I'm saying is that we've got 20,000 places for refugees every year, more per capita than anywhere else in the world, more in real terms than almost any other country in the world. We need to make sure that as people flee persecution, uh, whether it's in Afghanistan or Iran or whether it's in Africa or whether it's in Myanmar, uh, that they can do that in a safe way, working with the countries of our region, just like happened after the Vietnam War, not in a way where the person with the biggest checkbook gets on the boat first and the unlucky few end up drowning in the middle of the ocean with their children. So you've got to remove the incentive to get on a boat and that's what the agreement with PNG is about. Wouldn't removing the incentive to get on a boat then would to be to fix the problem... The, the, the issues that the people are fleeing from? That, yeah, and, and that is a much harder question too because um, you, are, you are never, ever on your own as one country going to be able to solve the problems of the world, uh, particularly the problems that are so vast, so difficult that we see in places uh, like Iran uh, or, or like uh, Afghanistan or in Africa. Uh, you're right to say that there are millions and millions of, of desperate people on the move um, and Australia is not going to solve that problem on its own. But what it can do is make sure that people that are seeking asylum uh, in Australia, um, that Australia works with the countries of our region to do that in a safe way. Well, I guess then Labor is not necessarily going to at all, if taken power, change policies at all to reduce the, the general, uh, because the general population is, is, in, uh, is against it. Um, they feel that, well, in my opinion and from my experiences, that they are, they are in breach of, um, you know, United Nations conventions. Um, so in the near future at all, will Labor be reducing their hardline policy? Well, our policy is designed to stop people dying. That's the most humanitarian thing we can do. I, 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 I would be surprised if there's anyone listening to this program that thinks it's a good idea for hundreds of people to drown. I don't. I don't for a minute. Uh, I think it is a bad thing to have a policy in place that says, come to Australia and 10% of uh, the people that get on, onto any given boat are going to die. That is the wrong way to go about helping people that are fleeing persecution. So Labor, Labor's policy is clear. We're going to increase, we've increased, I'm sorry, the number of refugees we take every year. The Liberal Party would reduce that back to 13,500. And we want to put in place policies with the countries of this region to help people that are fleeing persecution by going to the UN to seek asylum in Australia, not go through a criminal in a fishing village in Indonesia. Well, I guess we can leave it up to the voters to d decide whether that's fair or not. Um, but unfortunately, we have run out of time and we've covered a fair amount of topics, which I think is pretty cool. Um, just on the final note, uh, we... I think the voting system, it can be quite difficult True. Um, for some people, especially mm. people that don't necessarily uh, completely understand English. Would you like to explain exactly how to vote? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this because a lot of people in our community think that the way to vote on election day is just put a number one next to your favourite candidate and then put it in the box. That's not correct. If you do that, your vote won't count. In our local area in Western Sydney, the the percentage of votes that aren't counted on election day is 14 per cent. It's the highest in the country. We hold a, a very, very sad record of being um, the community with the highest level of informal votes or votes that aren't counted. You, to make sure that your vote is counted on Saturday, you must put a number in every single box 
on the green ballot paper. So uh, that means you put a number one next to your favourite candidate and then a two in another box, then a three, then a four, then a five, then a six, then a seven and so on. If you don't put a number in every single box, then your vote won't be counted. It'll be put aside and ignored. And unfortunately, this is, this is uh, our, our community is, uh, has got the highest level of informal votes in the country. We need to fix that. And that's why we're getting the message out to everybody that you must put a number in every box. Right, number in every box. I hope everybody remembers that. Um, thank you very much, Jason, for coming in and, and talking to us about uh, all the different Labor policies. Thank you very much. Uh, we wish you the best of luck in the election on Saturday. Um, you are listening to The Voice of Islam on 87.6 FM.